I just thought I would offer some principles that emerge from my research that are salient to our world. The first one is that in every market, if you plot on the vertical axis the performance of a product or a service over time, there are always two trajectories. One trajectory is the ability of customers to utilize improvement. Uh, that's a fairly flat trajectory. And there's another trajectory which charts the, the, the performance that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing better and better products. And almost invariably, the trajectory of performance improvement that innovating companies provide outstrips the ability of customers to use the improvement. So for example, go back for those of you who have a, little, a, a bit of gray hair, in the middle 1980s, when we were first learning how to use the early personal computers to do word processing. About every 30 seconds you had to stop to let the Intel 286 chip inside to catch up with you. Because the world's fastest microprocessor could not keep pace with our fingers. But as Intel introduced faster and faster chips, today their processor inside of your laptops, we only use about 10 to 15 percent of its capability. They've, their ability to improve it overshoots our ability to consume it. And that's always the case. And the reason why that's important is a, at a, at a uh, static point of view, something, something that is not good enough for what the, more, the core uh, customers need at one point is likely to improve so that it overshoots what they can use at a later point in time. And you can see this happening already in uh, online learning. The initial um, manifestations weren't really very good. Um, but my gosh, it's getting better and better and better. And people who are the least demanding customers are converted first. And then people who have other options are converted later. But you can predict with certainty that the people um, who are providing these things are motivated to go up market because in the end it's the pursuit of profit that causes the phenomena of disruption. Um, the second, if you can think about really the uh, territory of any industry, uh, you can conceive of them as concentric circles. And the innermost circle in a, an industry represent customers who have a lot of money and are quite skilled. And then as you move to the larger circles, they can represent in your mind larger populations of customers who have less money and less skill until you come to the outer circle, which is where you and I live most of our lives. Almost always, the initial appearance of an industry occurs at the center. And the reason why th they typically begin at the, in the center is the initial products and services are so costly and complicated that only the wealthy have access to them. And then innovations that make that complicated version more and more uh, affordable and simple, they allow people with less money to join the industry. So for example, um, the mainframe computer emerged in the 1950s as mainframes that filled a whole room. They cost two million dollars. Only the largest corporations and the largest universities could have one. And then the personal computer reduced the cost from two million to two thousand dollars. And so or ordinary people like John and I and, and Adam could have a computer and use it. And then the smartphone makes the cost from 2000 to $200, so that billions of people now have access to computing. And again, they always start in the center with the wealthy. And then disruption, which is a type of innovation that makes it affordable and accessible, makes it affordable and accessible for many more people. 
And uh, people who are in the core typically can't go after disruption because their economic model allows them not to make money when they go to the simple products. And these um, disruptive uh, innovations always occur competing against non-consumption because they make people who previously couldn't have access to be able to do that. Prior to the early 1970s, almost all consumer electronics products were made with the technology called vacuum tubes. A vacuum tube was about the size of a child's fist. And in a television, there were about 20 vacuum tubes. And these things sucked up a lot of power and, and, and uh, emitted a lot of heat. They were complicated uh, in today's money. The typical uh, TV costs to $4,000. And so only people with have, who had big apartments or homes and big bank accounts could watch TV. A new technology called the transistor emerged in the late uh, 40s. All of the vacuum tube uh, companies like RCA and Zenith and Westinghouse took a, a license from Bell Labs for the, the transistor because they knew it was going to be important. Um, but they took that technology into their laboratories to keep working on the technology because it wasn't, it wasn't good enough to support the power required in a TV. And while they were working on the technology, a company in uh, Japan called Sony introduced into the market not a television, but a little transistor radio that cost $2 used 10 transistors and made it so affordable and accessible that the low end of humanity, people we call teenagers today, <laughs> could have a, 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 a radio. And my brother and I bought one. We stuck it right here. I, we, was raised, we were raised in Salt Lake City. We had to face west to the Great Salt Lake to get reception. And it was a crummy signal, very tinny and static field. But we were thrilled with this new product because it was infinitely better than nothing, which was our other alternative. And the way we defined goodness was different. So our mother had a nice RCA radio in the house, and she measured the quality of that by um, the fidelity of the sound. My brother and I measured the performance of that by portabil portability and allowed us to do things that previously were not possible. That is, we could listen to rock and roll outside of the thumb of our mother. And then the technology got better and better and better. And what's important about it is that the technology doesn't then go into the center to transform the original players, but rather when the technology gets good enough, it sucks the customers out of the core to use the new product. And by evacuating customers from the core, the core companies like RCA just uh, disappear. And we see that happening today. The people who jump, jumped on board with online learning first were people who couldn't come to NYU. Um, but this is so much better than nothing that they were delighted to have this. The technology gets better and better, and then the customers get sucked out to that rather than this. And the, the question is not will this occur, but rather what role will we do in that? So more, but I'll wait until we have questions, I guess. Good to see you, John.